We're from Blue Water Church in Concordon, and uh, we're happy to be here. So Pastor Dave asked if I would come and speak, I think probably because I'm the only pulpit supply that he doesn't have to pay. Um, <laughs> so we're not paying Ken either, just so you know, it kind of evens up that way. But he gave me a specific topic to talk about, and here it is, and I quote, there are no deck chairs on this boat. There are no deck chairs on this. Is that a phrase he's ever said? Okay. Um, I think I know exactly what that means. And here's what it is. So on the screen is going to, there it is. This is our welcome slide that we use just about every Sunday morning in Kincardine. Our welcome back slide. I actually stole that from Carrie Newhoff. Um, but what I want you to notice is in the lower right corner, see the little blue boat? That is our Blue Water logo. That's been the logo for quite a while at Blue Water. It predates me. So I didn't design this logo. I inherited this logo, but I like this logo. But there are some things about that logo that just have to be acknowledged. One thing you have to acknowledge about that logo is it's a sailboat, right? You can see that. See that it's got a mast, and the mast is in a shape of a cross, which makes it very Jesus-y, right? Um, but it is a sailboat. I grew up in Meaford on the bay. Uh, we live in Kincardine, not on the bay. Didn't have enough money to live on the bay. We live in Kincardine, not on the lake, but near the lake. And you guys know all about sailboats. I don't know a lot about sailboats, but I know enough to say that a sailboat that doesn't have a sail, uh, that's a problem. So this sailboat doesn't have a sail. Um, so if this boat, and, and as I look at it, I don't think it has any motor. I don't see any motor on it. So if this boat is going to move in any kind of meaningful and intentional direction, it's going to have to be paddled, right? Okay, that's one observation you've got to make about this boat. Another observation is that it's a reasonably large boat. Like, it's not kayak-sized. It's not canoe-sized. It's, it's not even rowboat-sized. It's a fairly large boat. So if it's got to be paddled... It can't simply be paddled by one person, or two people, or six people. It's going to need a number of people to paddle this boat. Um, and so a common phrase at Blue Water has become, pick up a paddle. Pick up a paddle. We need you to pick up a paddle. We've got to row this boat together. So... Um, it's a fairly big boat. It can't be paddled by just one person. But another thing to notice is that it's, it's not so large a boat that it has room for passengers. It's not so large that it has room for deck chairs, and that's where the phrase comes from. There's no deck chairs on this boat. This is not a cruise ship, right? This is not a, a boat that has a giant deck for observation. There's no observation deck. There's no big deck lined up with all kinds of lounge chairs where you can just lie down and suntan while other people paddle. It's not that kind of boat. So there's no lounge chair. So the idea is pick up a paddle. Uh, it's not big enough for just a few to paddle. It's not so large that we can afford to carry passengers who are just along for the ride. Now, if you not notice the water, Notice that? It's kind of uh, Holy Spirity, right? If the mast is Jesus-y, the water is kind of Holy Spirity. And that's, that's good because we acknowledge our complete and utter need for the Holy Spirit to do the work of transformation. It's the Spirit that transforms lives. We can't do that. But we acknowledge our complete and utter need for the Spirit. And nowhere in the New Testament... Do you find that uh, we just simply lie down on deck chairs and suntan while the Holy Spirit just does everything? What we do find in the New Testament is this really crazy partnership that, that God invites us into, this, this wild, divine, human cooperative where God actually invites us to partner with him, to partner with the Spirit in the work of building the kingdom of Jesus. It's an incredible thing. If I were God, I wouldn't have done it that way. I wouldn't have invited you into that. I wouldn't have invited myself into that. If I was God, I would have done the whole thing myself. But he didn't do that. He invites you and me to partner with the Spirit in the work of building the kingdom. It's incredible. 
we get to participate in such meaningful uh, work as that. So if Blue Water Church is a church of 50 people, how many people do we need paddling? 50. We need 50 people paddling the boat. So pick up a paddle. There's no deck chairs on this boat. So that's where the lingo comes from. It's kind of blue water lingo. I think it's rubbed off on Dave a little bit, so he wanted me to talk about that. Now, Sobel Church is like 10 times bigger, right? Um, you have a much bigger boat. I know your thing is a lighthouse. Forget the lighthouse for today. Let's pretend your thing is a boat, okay? You got a much bigger boat. So if Sobel, if there's going to be, I don't know, 500 people here today, how many people do you need paddling? 500, right? 500 people. But here's my guess. My guess is if, if Sobel Christian Fellowship is like many, many, many other churches, probably about 20% of the people are doing almost 100% or maybe at least 80% of the paddling. That in many churches of 500 people, there's 100 people paddling and there's like 400 people lying on deck chairs getting a tan while the others do the paddling. And that can work. 100 people can paddle a boat designed to be paddled by 500, but it's not going to move in any kind of optimal fashion or at any kind of optimal speed. And 100 people can move that boat, but they will get very tired. They will get exhausted. They will get burned out. They may even get injured and have to just give up the paddling. And so, like here it is bluntly. Get off your deck chair, <laughs> pick up a paddle, and start paddling. If you've already got a paddle, pick up another paddle. You've got two hands. We can paddle with both hands. Now, and it's an amazing thing, to partner with other paddlers and to partner with the Spirit in the work of building the kingdom of Jesus. It's, a, it's an incredible thing. So Dave is going to be launching into a new teaching series. Is it next week? Where'd Andy go? Next week. And, like, it's no secret what it's called, right? No. Okay. So the series that Dave's going to launch into next week is called, Hey, That's Me. And I don't know everything that he's going to do in this series, but I suspect that he's going to walk through, um, uh, you know, some of the scriptures, look at some different characters in scripture, see how they're wired, see how they're gifted, see what their personalities are like, see how they work with other team members, see how they engage their giftedness in the work of the kingdom. And at some point along the series, you're, you're apt to go, hey, that's me. I'm like that. I'm wired like that. I'm gifted like that. I could do that. I could pick up a paddle, and I could paddle like that. And I hope that through the series, you do see yourself. And I hope, here's what I would love. This would be awesome. Since Dave's not here, we can talk about him. Here's what be, would be awesome. If after next Sunday service or one of the Sundays in this teaching series, if you went up to him after the service and, and, and say it in Sobel lingo, not blue water lingo, but say the equivalent of, you know, Pastor Dave, I want to get off my deck chair, and I want to pick up a paddle, and I want to paddle. You would freak him out. You would. You would, just, you would just see life and encouragement, and you would bring joy to him. You know what? You have an awesome pastor. I don't know if you know that or not. I hope you do. You have, yes, you have, you have a wonderful pastor. It is very difficult for churches to find good pastors. Look at Blue Water. They had to take me. They had no choice. You have a wonderful pastor. Uh, pray for him. Encourage him. Uh, stand by him. Support him and Lisa. And I it would be awesome if at some point during this series you said, you know what? I, I want to pick up a paddle. I, I see myself in some of those characters you've just described. But here's, here's the thing. You can pick up a paddle. You can pick up two paddles. You can start paddling like crazy, and it can be absolutely worthless. It can be absolutely worthless. There is something foundational that is absolutely crucial. There is, there's one thing that's, that's, that's foundational without which everything we do is worthless in terms of building the kingdom. There is one thing that makes everything else we do 
meaningful. And that one thing is love. It's love. Jesus said in John 13, 35, that it is by this one thing that people will know we are his followers. It's love. So Jesus said, people will know that we are his followers, not by our politics, not by what it is that we're against or opposed to, uh, not by our church attendance, but it is by the quality of our love for each other and for others. So that when people talk about Sable Christian Fellowship, what consumes the conversation is your love. The love that you have for each other and the love that you have for others. There is um, no principle more foundational in Scripture than love. And there is nothing more central to being a follower of Jesus than to become a passionate lover of people, an outrageous lover of people. I want to read to you some really familiar verses Um, from 1 Corinthians 13, probably the most famous love chapter in the Bible. Uh, These are the first three verses. If I speak in the tongues of men or of angels, but do not have love, I am only a resounding gong or a clanging cymbal. In other words, I'm just, it's just religious noise. If I have the gift of prophecy and can fathom all mysteries and all knowledge And if I have a faith that can move mountains, but do not have love, I am nothing. If I give all I possess to the poor and give over my body to hardship that I may boast, but do not have love, I gain nothing. Let me read those very same verses from a paraphrase called the message. If I speak with human eloquence and angelic ecstasy, but don't love, I'm nothing but the creaking of a rusty gate. If I speak God's word with power, revealing all his mysteries and making everything plain as day, and if I have faith that says to a mountain, jump, and it jumps, but I don't love, I'm nothing. If I give everything I own to the poor and even go to the stake to be burned as a martyr, but I don't love, I've gotten nowhere. So, no matter what I say, what I believe, and what I do, I'm bankrupt without love. Let me read that last sentence again. So no matter what I say, what I believe, and what I do, I'm bankrupt without love. You can have the gift of tongues. You can have the gift, even the tongues of angels, and that's a wonderful thing, but if you don't have love, it's just a big fat zero. You can have prophetic gifts. You can understand the, the deep things of God. You can have your eschatology nailed right down to the, as nailed down as it possibly can be. You can be so darn smart that you are sought after by the entire world just to give your opinion on theological matters. And every one of your opinions can be absolutely correct. You can have all your doctrines and all your theology just lined up like so many little toy soldiers, all in neat rose. You can have incredible faith, but if it's not motivated by love, and if it's not producing love, and if it's not said, done, and believed for the purpose of furthering love, then it's worthless. It's a big waste. It does nothing to build the kingdom. It does nothing in terms of having kingdom value. So, since we're being somewhat blunt, um, you have this awesome construction project going on. And it's amazing. It's exciting. It really is. And you know what? You could build the greatest church building in the history of the world. You could have, instead of having 500 people here on a Sunday morning, you could have 5,000 people here on a Sunday morning. You could have Christianity today, like outside, pounding on the door, wanting to write like a feature article about how awesome Sable Christian Fellowship is. You could have the slickest programs. You could have the rockinest worship bands. You could, you could each have a paddle in, in, in each hand. But if what's behind it isn't love, and if what results from it isn't love, 
then it counts for nothing in terms of kingdom value. Love is that much of an all or nothing deal. The Apostle Paul says, the Apostle James says, even Jesus himself says that if you get great at love, then you fulfill all the law. But if you don't get great at love, then it doesn't matter what else you fulfill because it's worthless. It's worthless. It's not just that, like, hey, your church can be pretty good without love. You can do, it can be, like, kind of great. It'd be even better with love. No, Paul says without love, it's worthless. It's absolutely worthless in terms of building the kingdom. The church of Jesus is to have the very same reputation that Jesus himself had. And the reputation that Jesus has was that of an outrageous lover, a passionate lover of people. His church, us, were to have the same reputation. Think about the people that Jesus attracted to himself. Who did he attract? Prostitutes? Tax collectors? Because of his outrageous and passionate love. My guess is, though, that the church of Jesus on the whole today is not characterized by love. It perhaps is characterized by maybe we've got a reputation for being religious or for being angry or for being judgmental or for being condemning or having moralistic crusades or being thought police or the moral police. I think the church is perceived of in many, many different ways, but unfortunately, one of the ways we're not typically perceived is that of being outrageously loving. This is why we don't have the 21st century equivalent of tax collectors and prostitutes just clamoring to hang out with us because of the, the, the value that they feel we ascribe to them. The prostitutes ran from the Pharisees, right? And they run from the church today. So we've got to get great at love. We've got to get great at it. Like if we don't get great at love, it doesn't matter what else we get great at because it's worthless. It, it's of no kingdom value. It's just, Paul says, irritating religious noise. Love is the one thing that gives your paddling meaning and significance. So if we've got to get great at love, it's probably kind of important that we at least have some kind of an understanding of what love is, right? And I don't think we do. I think we get it really confused and messed up because I love pizza. I love the Bee Gees. I, I say the Bee Gees because yesterday I was on the elliptical, you know those? And uh, so in my iPod was a bunch of Bee Gees music, which was really great. But it is hard to do this. I like go like that. Uh, but I, lo I love pizza. I love, the, I love the Bee Gees. I love my wife. I love Rob Nickerson right there. Um, I love my motorcycle. There's all kinds of, we use this one word love for all kinds of things, right? And it gets us all confused. And so when Jesus says something like, hey, love your enemies, it's like, what? I've got to have some warm, fuzzy, affectionate feeling toward my enemies? How in the world? Can I? I can't do that. Um, so the first century Greeks were like way smarter than we are. They had four words for love. We just got the one and it messes us up. They had four. So I just want to quickly identify these uh, four words for love. And for each of these words, I want to ascribe a posture. Now, this comes from um, a teacher named Greg Boyd, who kind of identified these postures. So I'm going to kind of borrow that as we go. But the first word is storge. If you were writing it out, it would be S-T-O-R-G-E, storge. Storge is an affectionate love. It's an affectionate love for objects or for characteristics. So I, I love the motorcycle, I love the car, I love the pizza, I love the Blue Jays, I love your smile, I love your hair, I love your shoes. That's storge, an affectionate kind of love for objects and characteristics. So the, the posture would be a looking at. Let, let's illustrate. Jeff, would you come on up here and help me uh, illustrate this? You don't have to do anything. You don't have to say anything. Just come on. This is, this is Jeff, by the way. I think you know who he is. Come on up here. You can, you can stand uh, yeah, right about here. So the posture of, of Storge is a looking at. So we're looking at, with affectionate love, at objects and characteristics. So what you need to do is just shake your hand. Just like this. So go like this, like you're looking at something. 
okay? Because that's storge. It's an affectionate love looking at objects, looking at characteristics. Okay, so ju just stay like that. Good. Um, so that's storge, all right? That's the first word. The, the second one, you, you just have to worry about the first one. I'll pick on some other people. I'm looking at one right now that I'm going to pick on. Um, the second one is philios. Philios. Philios um, is brotherly love. You've heard, obviously, the city of Philadelphia, the city of brotherly love. That's uh, philios. So it's, it's brotherly love. It's, it's a camaraderie. It's, it's a hospitable love. Um, so if the pot, what, ha, there, hey, yeah. So if the posture, if the posture of storge is a looking at the object and the characteristics, the posture of philios is a is a looking together with. So, Rob, come on up here, and Jamie, come on up here, because you guys, you guys philios each other, right? You're friends, you love each other. Well, let's pretend, let's pretend. This is uh, Rob and Jamie, Rob and Jamie, come on up here. So, oh yeah, so what I want you guys to do, here's philios. I don't have to gaze into his eyes. No, but that's coming, so shoulder to shoulder, absolutely shoulder to shoulder, okay, remember the Sears catalog, remember the wish book, I miss the wish book, I don't know about you, it used to come out about this time of year, and um, we'd get all geared up for Christmas, but if you remember the wish book, they would often have these male models who would, <laughs> who would strike a pose something like this, oh, no. yeah, so if you want to just put your hand on Jamie's shoulder, Jamie, if you just want to kind of point up there. So this is, <laughs> this is philios, all right? This is a, so we've got, we've got storge. This is an affectionate love, looking at objects, looking at characteristics. I love the pizza. I love the Blue Jays. I, I love the car. This is philios, so this is brotherly love. These guys are shoulder to shoulder. They're looking together at life, and everything's good. So hold, hold that. Um, the third word is, is really important, and I'm going to pick some helpers before I actually tell you what the word is. So I need Doug and Lynn. You guys are right there. Come on up here. So you, you can go right down here. So this is storge. This is philios. This is eros, all right? Uh -oh. Now, eros, no, you can, you, can, you can go this way. You can go this way. So eros um, is, is the Greek word from which we get the English word erotic. <laughs> and that's a kind of love. Yeah, it's, a, it's an intimate kind of love. It's a very sensual kind of love. It's a sexual kind of love. Um, so if, if storge is a looking at, and if philios is a looking with, eros is a looking into. So we wanna, you want to stand and gaze into each other's eyes. And this is where, Doug, you might say something like, oh, Lynn, your eyes are brown. brown. <laughs> And they have black dots in the middle, something like that. So this is, this is Eros. Um, oh, Lynn. <laughs> thank, thank you. That's, that's good enough. That's good enough. Okay, so there's three kinds of love. So we've got storge, an affectionate love for objects and characteristics. We've got philios, a brotherly love, a, a camaraderie love, standing shoulder to shoulder, looking at life together. We've got eros, which is a, which is a, um, a soulmate, soul-touching kind of love that's meant, meant for husbands and wives, all right? So here's what we're going to, we're going to dismiss these guys. Thank you so much. Give these guys a hand for helping us out. Now I want to talk about the fourth word for love. The fourth word for love is one you've probably heard of, and we're not going to have somebody come up and model it because I don't want to be perceived as making light of agape. Agape. Agape is the fourth kind of love. It is the most profound kind of love. Agape has nothing to do with feelings. Agape has nothing to do with emotion. So, storge does. Storge is all about feelings. Emotional, warm feelings about things and about characteristics. And philios has lots to do about feelings. It's this warm kind of brotherly love camaraderie, standing shoulder to shoulder, looking together at life. 
Eros, well, there's a whole lot of feelings built into eros, but agape has nothing to do with feelings. Agape is the most profound kind of love. Agape is the kind of love that God has for you, and it's the kind of love that he calls us to have for one another and for others. It's the kind of love that Ephesians tells us to live in, to live in love. As long as you live, love. It's agape. It's not about feelings. It's not about emotion. Really what it is, is an ascribing of worth, an affirming of worth. It's a commitment and it's an action. It's a commitment that we make at the core of our being that I just want to be an agape person. God is a God of agape. He calls me to be an agape person. I just want to be that. I'm not going to do it perfectly. I'm going to fail at it before I get out of the parking lot, but it's the direction that I want my life to go. So there's that commitment, and then it's an action, and the first action of agape is an action that you take in your mind where you just choose to agree with Jesus about the worth of all people, that everybody is created in the image and likeness of God and worth Jesus dying for. Therefore, they are of unsurpassable worth. That's agape. Now, if, if storge is a looking at and if Philios is a looking with, and if eros is a looking into, agape is blind. It's blind to, to storge issues. It's blind to philios issues. It's blind to eros issues. Agape looks at a person and looks past the externals and sees what is most profoundly precious about that person, namely their inherent worth as created in the image and likeness of God, worth Christ dying for, and therefore of unsurpassable worth. Think about it in terms of marriage. Um, so, imagine you're at a wedding, and there's a, a couple, they're making their vows to each other, I promise to love you until I'm dead, essentially, is what the vows go like. Um, the only kind of love that that can possibly be about is agape. Because you can't pledge lifelong affection. You can't. You can't do it. Let's say you get married and your wife has this long hair. You're very uh, uh, storge about her long hair. You've got this affection, like affection for objects and characteristics. And then like a week after the honeymoon, she gets it all cut off. And it's like, oh my goodness, why'd you do that? You wrecked your hair, but you still love her. You still love her because marriage is not based on warm, affectionate feelings for things or characteristics. Um, it's, it's good if there are some things in your marriage about which you are moderately affectionate toward the other person. That's really helpful. That's really healthy. But marriage is not based on that. Marriage is not based on warm, affectionate, storge feelings. Marriage is also not based on philias. It's not based on friendship kinds of love, friendship feelings. Now, it's good in every marriage if you can have a deep and abiding friendship where with your spouse you can stand shoulder to shoulder and look at life together. That's really great and that's really helpful, but marriage is not based on philias. It's not based on that. You can't promise lifelong philias. You can fall in and out of storge. You can fall in and out of philias. And marriage is not based on eros. Now, when there's eros in a marriage, it's really, really good. Do you know what I'm saying? Uh, really good, in fact. And in marriage, there are, there's these seasons of time, right, where it seems like eros is kind of firing on all cylinders, right? Yeah? No? Yeah? Yes? Definitely? Okay. But then there's other seasons of time where it's like eros goes on a vacation or gets a headache or something like that. And that's okay because marriage is not based on eros. It's awesome when eros is in a marriage, but it's not based on that. You can fall in and out of storge. You can fall in and out of philios. You can fall in and out of eros, but marriage isn't based on that. Marriage is based on agape. You cannot fall in and out of agape because agape is a choice. It's a commitment. And that's the love that we are called to. So think about this. Jesus says, 
love your enemies. Well, how do I do that? Am I supposed to have some warm, affectionate feeling about my enemies? No, we're not called to phileos, or we're not called to storge, our enemies, to feel affectionate and warm toward them. That would be weird. We're not called to phileos, our enemies, like, oh, I just want to stand shoulder to shoulder and look at life with my enemies. No, that would be just crazy. That doesn't happen. And we're certainly not called to eros, our enemies, to like want to be their soulmate and to gaze deeply into their eyes or whatever. We're not called to do that, but we are called to agape our enemies. We're called to look at our enemies and affirm worth, ascribe worth to them as created in the image and likeness of God and worth Jesus dying for. Therefore, our enemies are of unsurpassable worth. That is the love to which we are called. That is the love in which we are to walk. That is the love that must be beneath our paddling and beneath our getting off the deck chair and getting involved in paddling because we can paddle like crazy, but if we're not great at agape, it's worthless. It's worthless. Um, Oh man, I got all kinds of notes. That's boring. (laughs) That's, what time, Andy? Where's Andy? What time, how much more time do I have? I'm just going to plead ignorance and just keep going for a, for a few minutes anyway. So um, let me do this. Let me tell you something about 1 Corinthians 13 that will blow your mind. All right? Are you prepared to have your mind blown? 1 Corinthians 13, which is the passage that I read from a little bit, the really famous love chapter, it's between chapter 12 and chapter 14. All right? Uh, oh, 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 okay. Um, so, yeah, it's between chapter 12 and 14. Do you know what 1 Corinthians 12 and 14 are all about? Spiritual gifts, like supernatural gifts, right? Like gifts of tongues. The gift of tongues is a supernatural ability to speak in a foreign language that you've never learned. And then it talks about the interpretation of tongues, and that's the supernatural ability to interpret what somebody who is speaking in tongues is actually saying. Then it talks about gifts of wisdom, words of knowledge, and those kinds of things. And miracles, that's in chapter 12 and chapter 14. And the Corinthian church, they were all about the spiritual gifts. If you ask anybody at the church in Corinth, what's the one thing by which you assess your okayness as a church? They would have said, oh, the gifts like the gifts, because they're awesome. And Paul wasn't, you know, saying negative things about the gifts. In fact, Paul says stuff like, hey, I I speak in tongues more than all of you. So he's not poo-pooing the gifts. But the Corinthian church were exercising the gifts in unloving ways. And so it's no mistake that Paul takes chapter 13, the chapter on love, and fits it immediately after chapter 12 and before chapter 14. He didn't write it as a chapter to give us something to read at weddings. It's a corrective for this church whose one thing was the gifts. And what does Paul say? He says, you can do good things, but if you do good things without love, it's worthless. You can do spiritual things, and if you do spiritual things without love, it's worthless. You can, you can even do supernatural things. And if you do supernatural things without love, it's worthless. You can have all your doctrine nailed right down and be absolutely correct in every point of it, but if you don't have love, your doctrine, your theology is worthless. Worthless. In fact, you take love out of doctrine, you take love out of theology, and what you're left with is an ugly, divisive, pharisaical, judgmental, dare I say even demonic religion. And so Paul writes this beautiful chapter about love in chapter 13. For the Corinthians, their one thing was all, was all about the gifts. And Paul says, you can, you, can, you can have all these gifts, and if you don't have love, it's worthless. What's your one thing, Sobel Christian Fellowship? What's your one thing? For some churches, it's the number of people sitting in chairs. For other churches, it's the number of dollars in their bank account. For some churches, it's the number of square feet in their building. For some churches, it's the number of of programs and the number of volunteers and the number of missionaries. Those are the things by which they measure and assess their okayness. What's your one thing? 
You say, well, we don't have one thing. We've got three things. We've got know God, become like Jesus, change our world. Those are three awesome things. But if you couldn't have three, what would one be? Let me just say this. If it doesn't begin with L and end with of, it's the wrong thing. All right? Love is the one thing the one thing, the only thing by which we can assess our okayness as a church, whether we're on mission. Now, your three things, know God, become like Jesus, change our world, those are all about love, right? Know God. Who's God? 1 John 4, 8, God is love. You know God, you know love. That's his essence, that's his DNA. Become like Jesus. What is, what's, what's the main characteristic of Jesus that we see at the cross that we're going to celebrate in just a few minutes? His enemy love, his giving of himself for his enemies. God demonstrated his love in this, that while we were sinners, enemies, running away, shaking our fists at God, Christ died for us. And change our world. How are we going to change our world? Only as the life and love of God that's presented in Christ fills us up and then overflows from us to all others, even to our enemies. So we can see ourselves in biblical characters and say, hey, that's me. I'm like that. I'm wired like that. I can pick up a paddle. I can get off my deck chair. I can join with other paddlers. I can partner with the Spirit in this incredible thing of building the kingdom of Jesus. But if we don't have love, if we're not great at love, it's going to be worthless. We've got to get great at love. If we don't get great at love, it doesn't matter what else we are great at because it's going to be worthless. Does that minus two mean that I've gone two minutes over? Does it? Okay, let's pray, all right? I'll tell you what, just, just close your eyes. Um, so our eyes are closed. So I've said that agape is a commitment. It's a commitment that we make at the core of our being. I just want to be that. I just want to be that agape person. God is a God of agape. He's called me to be one who lives in agape. And it's a commitment that I make at the core of my being. And I just want to be that person. I'm not going to do it perfectly. I'm going to fail at it. But it's the direction that I want my life to go. How many of you just sitting here this morning, our, our, our eyes are closed. How many of you would just say this morning, I want to be an agape person. I want to be that. Just put up your hand. There's hands all over the place. I want to be that. That's awesome. I want to pray for you in just a second. But let me ask a, a, a little bit harder question. Um, think of somebody that you're having trouble loving. See them clearly. See their face in your mind. You're having trouble loving them. Maybe you work with them. Maybe you're going to see them at school on Tuesday. Maybe they're a neighbor. Maybe you're sitting beside them. Having trouble loving. Love is an action. Agape, it's a commitment and it's an action. The first action is the action of the mind where I just choose to agree with Jesus about the value of this person that I'm having trouble loving. They're created in the image and likeness of God and they're worth Christ dying for. And then agape is just hundreds and thousands of millions of small acts that just affirm their worth and ascribe worth to them. I want you to think of something that you can do, something that you can say this week that would affirm the worth of somebody you're having trouble loving. See them clearly. Think of something that you can do, something that you can say that will affirm worth to them. If it's somebody who's dangerous, maybe this just stays in your mind, and that's fine. But if think of something you can do, something you can say. God, I thank you for these people. Most of all, I thank you for your love. You are love. That's your, that's your DNA. You call us to live in that love, to be filled with your love and life as revealed to us in Jesus Christ and to reflect that love back to you in our worship, and then to overflow with that love to all others, including our enemies. And if we can love our enemies, we can love anybody. And God, I pray that this would be the abiding foundational characteristic by which Blue Water Church would be known and Sobel Christian Fellowship would be known, that we're known that the conversation about us is consumed because of the quality of our love for one another and for others. Thank you. In Jesus' name, amen.